So, uh, as you said, I'm Matt Johansson. Uh, I work at White Hat Security, so you have any reason to believe what I say, this is what we do. We're an application security company. Uh, we are a software as a service web scanner. Basically all we do is hack websites day in, day out, find vulnerabilities in them. Uh, so that's kind of the data I bring to the table. I think we just passed 20,000 websites under service that uh, our data pool comes from. Uh, when I originally gave this presentation, I gave it with Jeremiah Grossman, so I left this slide in to kind of give him a hat tip. You know, he did, uh, he did part of this research, like he needs my hat tip, right? But uh, his bullet points are slightly more impressive than mine. But uh, as, as the intro uh, introduction said, yeah, I've done this speaking thing a few times, but the more important bullet that I'd like to announce here is I'm hiring a lot. We have an office in Houston. If you're looking for an entry-level web hacking job, come see me afterwards. I'll leave it at that. All right. So let's talk about browser security. So um, who thinks the web is broken? Oh, you're all here. Come on. Everyone should raise their hand, right? OK, cool. So the, the way the web works is you know, inherently kind of flawed, right, in a few ways. Uh, so I'm going to try to breeze through the first part of uh, my talk here, just because this is an application security conference. You guys should be aware of a lot of the things I'm about to say. Uh, I'm still going to touch on them, but I'll try to be pretty quick, right? But you guys have all heard of CSRFs, CSRF, XSS. Uh, if you haven't, please excuse me, I'm going to fly past them. Uh, so, you know, if, if uh, you know, we get cross-site scripting uh, into a web page anywhere, right, we can have our JavaScript malware, and here's a list of things that, you know, this is nothing new, this is stuff that uh, JavaScript-based malware can perform, right? Research, much smarter than, researchers much smarter than me have talked about topics <laughs> such as Right, so uh, I'm, I'm not really going to focus on a lot of, uh, of these, but uh, what we did and, uh, in our research really focuses on the, uh, the last two. Uh, so yeah, we'll see that a little bit later. But uh, let's go through these each real quick. So these are all things that JavaScript-based malware can do, so kind of keep that in mind as I go, as I go through this. Right? Uh, so <clears throat> you've all heard of CNN. Here's a nice little GET request that I saw. This is an actual... URL uh, that is sent to CNN. I wasn't hacking them or anything. That is a URL that they choose to send to themselves uh, to gather some metrics on browser interrogation. Uh, what kind of stuff do we see in there? We see your operating system. We see your, you know, just your user agent. Oh, you're using Firefox. You're on a Mac. Uh, you came from here. You clicked this. You clicked that. Now you're here. This, that, and the other thing, right? We're uh, or, or fingerprinting your browser so we have a better picture of who you are and why you're on our website and all this kind of stuff. This is how the web works. Great, right? Um, so you can get a lot of information out of this. Uh, there's actually an, uh, an EFF project that I can never remember the name of uh, that is, is, uh, is, does someone know what I'm talking about? The browser fingerprinting project? Shout it out. Pado Optic. That's it, right? Thank you. So uh, there's a browser fingerprinting project. It, it is a very unique uh, fingerprint of your browser that can be made just by you going to the website, right? They, they have control over your browser while you're there. They can figure out the plugins you have installed, the date you installed them, the date you installed your actual browser. All of this leads to one significantly unique hash of who you are, right? Uh, then there's things like CSRF, right, that JavaScript can force you to do. Uh, so if I'm, I have my JavaScript in your browser, I can dynamically create all these image tags. It's a really easy way to, to do some cool CSRF stuff. Uh, I can force you to hack another site. Hey, I know there's this SQL injection in this site, but I don't feel like hacking it. Why don't I force you to hack it for me, and then I'll get the data back? Cool? Then I'm not involved, right? That's that first example right there. Uh, you can force people to download torrents, get them on all sorts of lists and in trouble, or you know, let's get Justin Bieber fan club uh, trending on Google for whatever reason. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, it, the, you pull a weave, right? You, you guys have seen this in the news, right? It lets enumerate some, some UUIDs and, uh, and, and, and try to collect some data that way. And I don't want to go to jail, uh, so I'll make you do it. Uh, or let's cast a vote if someone's silly enough to have a vote as a GET request, which I've never seen. Um, okay, so uh, login detection, another thing we do with JavaScript, right? So there's a, I think there's six techniques. Does that say that? Oh yeah, it's on that slide. Six techniques uh, to, that are known to kind of do some login detection to figure out what other websites you're currently logged into while you're on my website, right? So uh, a really easy one uh, is, is that, that top line right there. You can, uh, again, create an image tag, make a call out to another site, right? So say you know there is a picture on a site, some image file, that is only accessible while logged in 
to that application, right? So let's uh, request that image and we'll do an onload event, right? If that image loads successfully, fire some function that lets me know that you're logged in. If that image errors, you're not logged in. Uh, as simple as that, right? So if you find the image, if you can get to it, you're logged in. All things that are how the web is supposed to work, right? Great. Uh, so w why is this valuable to anyone, right? So if, if you're running, if I'm running my JavaScript in your browser and I know you're logged in to some other site, what else does JavaScript have access to? Someone scream it. Oh, come on. Oh, page. Oh, page. What else? Did? Cookies, thank you. Someone give that guy a cookie. Uh, yeah, so uh, if, if I know that you're logged into your bank in another tab and you're on my website, what else does JavaScript have access to? The cookie for that bank. I can take over your, your identity in your bank, no problem, right? So login detection really helps tailor what kind of attack you're going to do with JavaScript. We can de-anonymize you. Uh, Jeremiah did a, a bunch of blog posts called the I Know series, like what I know about you if you come to my web page. Uh, he, he used some, uh, some techniques such as clickjacking, right? Well, I already told you a bunch of stuff that we know about you because I can interrogate your browser, right? I can geolocation, OS type, all that kind of stuff. But if I get you to click even once, I can float all three of these buttons on top of each other, a Twitter follow button, a like button on Facebook, and a plus one Google button. Make them invisible, make them follow your, uh, follow your mouse. So anytime you click once on my web page, you send out all these requests so I know your real name, uh, your Twitter name, your Facebook page, and what I have access to any of the information that's also that you choose to put on your Facebook page, right? So now all of a sudden, instead of just some browser and operating system information, I actually know who you are, right? Or at least who you are as you're logged into any of those three services, right? Uh, we can do intranet hacking. Okay, so yeah, like I don't need to put a patch to this internal website because it's internal facing only. Uh, well, incorrect, right? So if I get you to come to my web page and again do some iframe or image source request to uh, 192.168 address, that, uh, that request is going to go through just fine. Now all of a sudden I can start accessing your internet, internal facing only applications from the internet, right? I'm, I could force your computer to do it for me and start, uh, start hacking there. I could force you to XSS. This is similar to the forcing the SQL that I showed on an earlier slide. I know of a cross-site scripting attack. I don't want to send that cross-site scripting attack. Let's force you to send that cross-site scripting attack and see it steal all these cookies and sessions and things like that. Then there's traditional malware, right? So we hear about this a lot. Um, so drive-by downloads, like you come to my site, I'm hosting malware on it. I'm going to use some sort of browser exploit or uh, plug-in that you're using and exploit that to actually force you to download some bad malware and I'm going to have control over your actual machine, right? Now I'm breaking out of the browser and making you download, uh, download some malware. What's everyone's favorite way to get this onto your computer? Last word on the slide, right? <laughs> uninstall it, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> patch, 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 uninstall, yeah. So uh, Java's, Java's shooting fish in a barrel kind of thing with, uh, when it comes to drive-by malware and browser it is, but again, this is just another thing I can do to your computer if you come to my website, because it's how the web works. Uh, so here's, here, the next two are the, what we're going to kind of focus on and what we focused on in, in our research when it comes to our browser botnet, which I promise I'll get to soon. So uh, some, we can do some distributed, well, distributing quotes. If you come to my website, I can force your browser to do some hash cracking for me, right? This research has actually been done again, by someone much smarter than me. Uh, and he actually proved that JavaScript is really fast at doing this. From a single browser, they got up to 100,000 MD5 hashes per second. That's a pretty serious number from one browser, right? So if we distribute our JavaScript malware, that now we're, we're cracking a lot of hashes pretty quickly. It's a pretty serious uh, hash cracking botnet that you built, or whatever you want to call it. So there's actually a tool online. You can all go check this out. Some links at the bottom. I know it's kind of small. Uh, but this tool is Ravon, uh, and it uses, in your browser, it uses HTML5 web workers. Is anyone familiar with these? Everyone kind of? Maybe? No? Okay. So uh, what web workers are allowing you to do is use multiple processes in a single browser to kind of send these requests and, and, and do these sorts of things, right? So uh, browsers can uh, send out six simultaneous requests. Uh, web worker adds a seventh, and uh, using these web workers, you can kind of harvest the CPU time and actually start cracking these, uh, these hashes. So you see each of these web workers, uh, each of these boxes is worker. If you scroll down on this website, you'll see like six of them, right? So worker zero, worker one, 
uh, and each of them are, are doing about, uh, was that, six, 60 to 70,000 hashes per second per web worker. Now all of a sudden you're getting a little bit faster per browser. It's really just the limit of how fast that computer in that browser is that you can start cracking, cracking passwords. And then there's the, the main one we're gonna focus on is uh, distributed denial of service, right? So <clears throat> using cross-origin requests, again, from web workers, uh, a browser can actually send a ton of, of get requests relatively quickly uh, and, and kind of flood another web server with connections. So think of this, this isn't a traditional denial of service attack that you hear about and read in the news. It, it, we're not measuring this kind of denial of service attack in gigs per second or anything. We're not trying to uh, send as much data as possible. We're trying to send as many requests as possible, right? So you see this TC, it's trying to hold up, hold open a lot of TCP requests. Uh, and just fires tons and tons of HTTP requests synchronously. Um, again, that same researcher uh, has published a, a ton of research on that, and he got his up to about 10,000 requests per minute uh, from one browser. Uh, it's, it's not bad, right? So I mentioned this connection limit. Um, <clears throat> so each, each of the modern browsers uh, allows roughly six simultaneous connections from one browser uh, at any given time to a given host name, right? So this is actually uh, not a security uh, reason. This is actually a performance reason. They don't want uh, you know, this website waiting forever to load you know, a thousand images if someone chose to put a thousand images on some site or something like that. So they do six at a time and they kind of just uh, chip away at the site's performance thing. Uh, some mobile browsers you can get to like eight. There's this uh, website called Browserscope. You can go and check this out. Whatever browser you're having, you can uh, see all the connections that they can make out at any given time. So that middle column is what we're talking about. Connections per host name is six for all modern browsers. So, um, whoop, I went a little too far. Okay, so we figured out how to bypass that, um, in Firefox at least. So, for those of you who kind of can read some JavaScript, this isn't, I, I hope this isn't, you know, too complicated code or anything. <laughs> it's actually, you know, fairly, fairly uh, simple code and why I choose to write this in JavaScript. Uh, on the left, you can kind of see that, that for loop, right? So uh, I'm dynamically creating image tags, and I'm saying, okay, please send out uh, you know, a request per image tag to this given URL and iterate through I, yada, yada. Uh, so how we actually bypassed it is not sending it via HTTP. We send it via FTP to port 80. Uh, so Firefox doesn't care anymore. There's no six connection limit. Uh, there's no limit at all. Uh, it's not like it hits a different limit. There is no limit. So I have a little demo video. I know it's a video. I'm, uh, I'm lame, but demo gods aren't usually very kind to me. Uh, let's try to, my resolution is all screwed up. Hold on one second. No, you're not gonna go full time on, full screen on me? There's that button, that's what I want. Okay, so what you can see here is a simple Apache server status page. I'm running an Apache server. This, uh, I can't remember if this one was local or in EC2, but I, we did it in both, local and, and in Amazon. And um, you can see the, the terminal above it, I'm refreshing every one second. I'm refreshing the status page every one second, just so I can see what's going on with the Apache web server. And then uh, on the bottom left, you can see the, uh, can everyone kind of make out these numbers in the bottom left? Are they they're big enough on the, on the big screen? Um, the number I really would like to focus on is that one request is currently being processed. So that's, that's kind of the, the simultaneous request. One request currently being processed is just the, the refresh, right? So we're gonna watch that number. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, you can see this is just me proving my log is actually refreshing. And here's the code I wrote. Same code as on the slide. I have, I have a for loop, well I have three for loops, they're all zeroed out though. Uh, I'm gonna do this top for loop, I'm gonna actually add some numbers to the loop. I'm gonna dynamically create that many image tags, right? So I'm gonna dynamically create 100 image tags. Uh, I'm gonna hit it, and you're gonna see, they're gonna come back, see that number went to seven, so one is for the refresh and then six is, is for the images. And you'll see these images come back six at a time. And I have a, I have a wait in, in between here, so just, you know, you can, kind of see what's going on. So it's doing six at a time, uh, the, these images come back. You kind of get the idea, right? But that's seven from one browser. Uh, <clears throat> well, it's actually six to one host, but you know, 
I don't know what that was, but it just went up to 44. But uh, now we're going to go ahead and do the same exact code, but all I changed was instead of HTTP, we did FTP to port 80. All right, so let's uh, forget what number I do here. I think the magic Apache number is right around 300 with the for loop. Um, so 20, I don't want to kill it yet. See that went immediately, 21, right? 21 requests simultaneously being processed from one browser uh, to, to Apache. So that kind of proves we bypassed the six thing. Um, but what, a, what if we wanted to take down a, our Apache log? Yeah, you can see it in our logs here. So we kind of found that the magic number for the, root, uh, for the loop is 400, and the magic number for Apache to stop responding to my server requests is 260 something, 266 requests being processed, 279. I'm gonna refresh, and as this video kind of goes towards the end here, it stops refreshing. You guys get the point, but with one browser, I DOSed my own, Apache, like just default Apache install running locally. Uh, so that was pretty cool, I guess, right? Do we think that's cool, kind of? <laughs> DOSed myself, can't get to it anymore. Yeah, you see it's just spinning down here in the bottom. Server, one second per time, is just it's just stuck on 279. All right, so what can I do with this cool piece of information? What would you do? <laughs> are we back? Okay. So, uh, what are some of the benefits to hacking this way? Um, you know, via JavaScript, uh, distributed JavaScript, right? Forcing other people's browsers to do your bidding, right? So there's really nothing to detect. Um, there's no, no exploit. I haven't popped a browser. I haven't left a trace. I just kind of ran some JavaScript in your browser, right? So there's few chases, few alarms. But the, the one that I really love is, th like, I'm not doing anything that any normal website can't do at any given time. This is how the web is supposed to work, right? I'm not, you know, being the lead hacksaw up here and, you know, writing some ODA and <coughs> popping boxes or anything like that, whatever the kids are saying these days. I'm actually just writing JavaScript. So, uh, you know, it's really, really easy. You saw the few lines of code that I have, right? I mean, I, I could teach anyone to, to write those few lines of code. It's really easy. But how do we distribute this malware, right? So here's some traditional ways of distributing JavaScript, but, uh, JavaScript based malware, right? So you have cross-site scripting, you want to start hacking a bunch of people, what do you do? What's the next thing you do? Uh, on this list, which, uh, which one do you guys think is most prominent like, on the internet today? Like, what do most people do if they, if they want to start hacking people with JavaScript? Just scream it out. I just wanna, I'm just curious what you guys think is the most popular distribution method. Guys, stop, stop screaming. Search engine poisoning. Search engine poisoning, all right. Well, all right. What was the other one I heard? Third party web widgets. Web widgets, that's a good one, right? I think the most popular one is probably email spam, right? I think we all deal with that a lot, and, uh, and, and you know, email spam, phishing attacks. Uh, but, but any one of these, right? It, we, we've seen these time and time again. These hit the headlines. Uh, you know, that, the top one, right? So you, ha you already have a high traffic site. Uh, that's kind of shady, why not throw my own JavaScript on there and get them to start doing stuff? Or I found cross-site scripting in a popular site that was persistent, uh, you know, i.e. like the Sammy worm, right, on MySpace. It took MySpace down in, in a few hours. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, here, here's a bunch of methods. I, I think that we needed to think a little bit bigger, right? Um, so I'm gonna invoke the Crockford. So Douglas Crockford, for those of you who don't know, kind of wrote the book on JavaScript. Uh, and this is a quote from him, the most reliable, cost-effective method to inject evil code is to buy an ad. All right, well, let's do that. Cool, so how do you buy an ad? Um, so for those of you who don't know how the, kind of the, the advertising network ecosystem works, right? Uh, very rarely does someone who wants to advertise on a website go to that website and say, hey, I'd like to advertise on your website, here's money, here's my ad, please display this ad. 100% of the time, yada, yada, all right? That's very rarely how it works. I'm sure there are some outliers, but how it usually works is uh, the people who would like to advertise go to an advertising network, which is kind of the middleman in the operation, and uh, they give them money in their ads, uh, and then that network has some sort of uh, collection of, we're gonna call them publishers, just so sites that they're gonna push these ads out onto. Uh, and then you know people come to those sites and that's it, right? So it separates the advertisers from from yeah, the, the direct publishers. So here are some popular ad networks. Had to distinguish that 
based on this template, it kind of looked, yeah, we caught this when we were doing our dry run that it looked like White Hat was part of the blob. Uh, but uh, we are not a that network. So you guys might have heard of some of these. You might not have heard of some of these. Uh, Google AdSense and DoubleClick are probably uh, two of the most popular ones. No, the two most popular ones. Uh, if you've ever watched any web traffic ever via any method of you watching web traffic, you've definitely seen DoubleClick, a request go out to DoubleClick. Uh, but uh, so the other thing that we want to focus on here is some of these allow third-party JavaScript. What could go wrong, right? Uh, and some of them don't, right? So we wanted to focus our research on the ones that, that, that did. Uh, but we said, okay, here's some more popular ones that don't allow JavaScript. Uh, let's just write them and see if, hey, if I ask nicely, will they let me put JavaScript in there? And uh, this is the email that, that uh, Jeremiah got back that we thought was kind of funny. Uh, we wrote one of these ad networks. We said, hey, you know, we'd like to, to buy an ad. We'd like to include our own JavaScript in that ad. We promised we won't do anything bad, yada, yada, something like that. And this was the response. I'm going to just read it verbatim because I think it's hilarious. So uh, he said, yeah, the only third party code we allow is from large ad uh, serving companies like DoubleClick and such who we trust. Don't just get a warm and fuzzy feeling that they trust each other. Uh, yeah, they're definitely already scanning their side to prevent vulnerabilities, so we have nothing to worry about. Yeah, yeah, right? Who thinks that's you know completely wrong, right? Yeah, okay. So uh, we just thought that was kind of funny, but uh, I, I figured if we showed up with enough money and asked enough people nicely, that even the, the ad networks that don't publicize that they allow JavaScript probably would have some method of allowing us to to write our JavaScript uh, into the ad. So then there's another type of network. I'm not going to call it an ad network. Uh, that we utilized in this research. Again, this is just kind of a distributed browser uh, methodology. So th this network uh, allows you to just buy browser minutes, right? So the important distinction here, um, so yeah, so we go here, 10,000 minutes is about 12, 12 and a half bucks. Um, and uh, that's 10,000 minutes of browser time. You just give them a URL and they will guarantee that some browsers, some collection of browsers somewhere will collectively spend 10,000 minutes just on that URL, right? So this is a legitimate website. I, I, I'm like really having a hard time finding legitimate reasons for a service like this to exist, uh, but it exists. Uh, the other way to kind of get into a network like this or get minutes to use out of a network like this is to offer your browser up to like as a thing that will sit on websites and you know, you offer your browser time, you get browser time back kind of thing, right? Um, so uh, kind of the, yeah, we'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to more of this later, but the important part between this and an ad network is that the ad network doesn't guarantee any time that the ad is going to be on the web page, right? It guarantees that the ad will get into a browser, but it doesn't guarantee how long that ad will stay there. So for things like the hash cracking, right, how many things can I do per second, that's the JavaScript running, you know, the entire time the ad is loaded, uh, but that that ad could be up there for two seconds, or that ad could you know someone could load a web page and you know walk away to get some food or something, and and then it's just loading for minutes, right? Uh, this guarantees that, right? There is no there, there, like you're going to get this many browser minutes for twelve and a half dollars, right? So uh, just so you know, in our research, we never ran out of those ten thousand minutes, right? Uh, so we've only ever given them twelve and a half dollars. So uh, yeah, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna focus on focus on these last couple here in our research, and we actually went and did this, right? So I went and actually purchased an ad out of the ad network that allowed me to write my JavaScript in it, and let's see what we can do, right? So the important part that I'd like to focus on here for, for you guys listening for, for the rest of the talk is the economics of this. Um, so how like ad network lingo and uh, kind of how they price it out is cost per impression or cost per thousand impressions rather. Uh, so that varies anywhere from pennies to a few dollars, uh, but the one that we used that uh, allowed us to write our JavaScript was 50 cents per thousand impressions. When I say impressions, I want all of you to think browsers, okay, because that's, in, that's what it is, right? Impression is every time that ad loads in a browser, it's executing my JavaScript, right? So that is a browser that is a bot in my botnet as far as I'm concerned. So it's 50 cents per thousand of them. So for your million browser botnet, using some really awesome math I learned in elementary school, that's $500. Uh, so yeah, this is a pretty economic way of, of doing things, and I kind of wanted a uh, proof of concept to see if it, it could actually legitimately generate uh, 
some, some, a lot of traffic and let's do a distributed denial of service attack. So here is the, uh, here's some screenshots from the actual admin panel of the ad network. So this is a really, has anyone ever done this? Has anyone ever gone to ad networks besides Google and like bought ads? I'm just curious. Yeah, one of you, okay, so not too many of you, right? I didn't think so. I had never done it. It's a really weird world of advertising, right? They, they, they let you get very granular. Obviously, they didn't, they, this panel was not designed for someone like me to come and try to buy an ad that I didn't care about at all. I just cared about the JavaScript running in browsers. So there was a lot of things that I needed to go through that I like, could not care less about, uh, like keywords and geolocation and you know, campaign titles and there's a lot of lingo I had to figure out what, what they were talking about. But anyway, here's some, here's some screenshots from it. Um, it. You know, This is just me throwing a few bucks at it just to just kick the tire and see if I could see the traffic on the other side. I wasn't really trying to do anything yet. But you guys can see, um, you throw money in this thing, you say, okay, you're allowed to use this much money per day, go, right? Go on this campaign, you can create multiple campaigns, uh, you can target multiple audiences. So you can see uh, at this point, you know, I, I had put you know, somewhere near 30 or 40 bucks in it. Uh, I said, you know, use 12 bucks a day, and you know, today I had 16,000 impressions. The really funny part is this graph on the bottom here uh, kind of breaks down how many impressions you got per day and the click conversion rate, which I also didn't care about, but the first time I ever turned this thing on, I got 15 clicks. <laughs> I wasn't even trying to get clicks. I'll show you guys the ad in a second. It's gonna be really funny once you see it, that people actually clicked my ad. Uh, that's way more dangerous, right? <laughs> if, if, if people clicked on it, you can do all sorts of stuff. I didn't even care if people were clicking on it, right? But here's another cool part, uh, again, of this admin panel. This was unique to, well, not very unique, but it's unique to the advertising networks that allow JavaScript have something like this. So you can either just give them an image and a URL, and you can say, hey, put this image in this box, and when you click it, it's gonna go to this URL. Or, in this ad network, they said, here's a box, write your code. Ta-da! <laughs> this is my trick I did, okay? Yeah, nothing too crazy here. So uh, at first I was just writing my JavaScript straight you know, into this box, um, but there actually is an approval process that your ad has to go through, right? It's really, really strenu strenuous, there's a blood test involved, it's, uh, you know, you do also a hair sample, no, 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 right? So uh, there is an approval process, but they could, uh, I mean, they had no idea what JavaScript even was, I don't think, uh, never mind how to read it. Uh, all they cared about was your picture fits in a box, and when you click it, it actually goes to a website that exists. Those, that was the criteria of approval for an ad. I'm sure if I tried to get some like adult image in here, maybe, I don't know, actually, I have no idea. I'm, I'm gonna stop that sentence. They might have allowed that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, they, they might have just been absolutely fine. I have no idea what like their criteria was for the picture. Yeah, 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 right, right. Well, that had nothing to do with the approval of the ad. That's once you start running the campaign, right? So I actually didn't throw any money into it at this point. I was just trying to see if it, if it could work. Uh, and, and then I was gonna throw money into it. But yeah, I'm sure they would like to receive the, the PayPal. Yeah, I felt really stupid sending them money via PayPal at Black Hat when I first gave this talk. Yeah, I'm owned. Like, <laughs> I was like, this is the most dangerous, stupid thing I've ever done. Okay, so, um, but anyway, so anytime you change this code, you have to get it re-approved. And there is a time delay here. It, you know, they're not exactly you know, sitting there, you know, or it's, it's not an automated process, right? Someone actually has to look at this and click on this ad, which I found really funny eventually when I realized that when I was writing my code, I was like, oh, we're getting hits already, and I didn't even put any money in it. It's like, oh no, that's the person approving my ad's browser right there, okay. <laughs> well, if you ever want to hack an ad network, just try to get an ad approved, right? <laughs> I wasn't trying to hack them, though. <laughs> so, uh, so I was writing my code directly in here, but anytime I wanted to tweak something, say, in my for loop or in the URL that I was sending traffic to, it had to get reapproved, and it took a few hours sometimes. Sometimes they were on the East Coast, I was on the West Coast at the time. It, it was just annoying. So what I did, you can see in the bottom box, I said, forget this. Uh, I'm just going to source in script source my JavaScript file from my server. Uh, that's it. Done. Approved. Stamp of approval. Great, right? Uh, so now, anytime I change my code, uh, it didn't have to get reapproved. So the other thing this told me was, okay, in some magic dreamland out there, right, where all of a sudden all the ad networks start hiring static code analysis people who are really good at reading JavaScript and seeing if it's malware or not, which may happen, hold on, I'm, you know, right, so stay with me, right? So 
uh, if they do hire this army of you know, JavaScript <laughs> analysis people, uh, I can get my ad approved and then immediately change it to, you know, if there was ever something that they said, hey, this looks weird, this is like, not approved, if I went this method, the code can change back and forth. It doesn't matter. And, and there's no way they could keep up with something like that. And even if they did you know, care about the JavaScript that I was writing. So here's the ad that I did, uh, that I picked. I just pulled this right off of White Hat's homepage. Uh, I just, you know, I was lazy. I was like, hey, here's your banner, yeah, whatever. Uh, but I, then I realized, like, a, a few hours after I was already playing with this, it doesn't say our name anywhere in it. I was like, oh, that's perfect. It doesn't say anything. It just says, get a 30-day free trial with a lock. <laughs> I got 15 clicks on this in the first day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a free to claim it now. Why, why wouldn't I click on it, right? Of what? I have no idea of what. Maybe they thought they, whatever website they were on, was, I have no idea, right? Uh, it, it worked, right? But I was really lazy and didn't find other pictures. I just wanted, I didn't care what the ad looked like. I, I didn't care if the ad was invisible, right? I didn't want anyone to look, on it, look at it, click on it, anything, right? I just wanted my JavaScript running. So I was pretty lazy, but only one of these got approved. Uh, just because that one fit in that box, and they just thought the other ones were ugly and disapproved them. You can see disapproved, right? They all have the same exact pieces of code in all of them. I just was trying to get as much traffic as I could. Turns out that it didn't matter that 9.6% of my campaign traffic uh, was plenty. Uh, so again, this is uh, just the code that we used, right? Uh, you know, we have our Amazon EC2 instance. Uh, we cranked that number up a little bit to 10,000. Uh, we threw I at the end of the URL. We did not have to do that. We just wanted to see, have some general idea of how long our JavaScript was running. So how far into this loop did, uh, did this get? I just didn't want to see a bunch of the same exact URL in my logs. I would like to see an incrementing number so I can tell, hey, this JavaScript is running for X number of minutes. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So we, we kind of let that go, and we fired up the browser minute thing at the same time, right? We said, hey, why not? Just, uh, just throw them together. So the cool thing about the browser minute renting service is it's instant. As soon as you give it a URL and click go, you start seeing traffic. It's not very fast, though. It's not like a bunch of browsers all at the same time running my code. It's a pretty steady tick of traffic, but it, it definitely helped get the hits. Uh, the hits way up, and you'll see that. So you guys remember my video, right? So watch the same numbers, right? So watch, watch the same group of numbers uh, down in the bottom left, right? So we're going to watch the, uh, the concurrent requests. We're going to watch the total hits this time also, right? Uh, so yeah, we see five. I'm going to kind of click through and, and do some. We see, you know, after 10 minutes, we got 15,000 hits. Again, just five concurrent requests, though, so it's not that fast, right? There's not that many browsers. Um, then I looked at my logs, and I thought something was kind of funny. How many of you have heard of PhantomJS? Raise your hands. Cool. So for those of you who haven't, PhantomJS is a, is a headless like browser that you can run in JavaScript, runs on Node. Uh, so I think this is some, I don't know which side of that browser renting service is gaming the system, but one of them is gaming the system. This is not a real browser. This is a command line, but this is some automated script acting like a browser. So either people are gaming the system to get free minutes out of this service, or that service isn't actually have a network of browsers, and they're just running this kind of stuff. I don't know. I thought it was hilarious, though. I, I didn't care, right? The traffic was getting to my server that I'm trying to DOS. That's all I cared about. But I figured I'd share it anyway, because it's uh, pretty funny. So again, back to the logs here, right? So five more minutes. Uh, we have 28,000 hits. Uh, 30 some odd requests per second. Uh, another five minutes, we have 40,000, 43,000 hits. It's getting a little faster, 11 requests per second, uh, concurrent requests being processed. Um, you know, just a few minutes later, all of a sudden that, you know, the, the browser minute thing was kind of bumpy too. It just kind of goes all over the place. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have 33 concurrent requests. That's, you know, that's getting there. That's definitely a few browsers running our code at the same time. Um, 25 minutes, we have 82,000 hits to our site, uh, 19 concurrent. Um, 35 minutes, we got, we have six figures. Hits, not bad. Um, so this is when the advertising network kicks in. There is a time delay. So the browser minute running service, like I said, was instant. The advertising network, you give it money and you say go, 
uh, like here's this campaign and, and it's gonna go do its thing. Uh, it takes about 43 minutes and 26 seconds. No, so it takes about 40 minutes before you actually start seeing real traffic come into, uh, come in, uh, you know, that these ads are actually being distributed at that point, right? Once you fund the campaign. Um, so this kicks in and now look at the concurrent requests. 255. Uh, so that was the kind of magic number that we showed from one browser, right? When I showed my Firefox connection limit bypass, that was the magic number to, uh, you know, just completely stall a default Apache install. Um, again, no DOS protection or anything like that. So we, we were like, okay, you know, we have 130,000 hits, but it's only 36 megs because this is just 404 pages over and over again, right? Um, but now we have the concurrent things, and this is when uh, that, that configuration page really has trouble loading. That, that, that server is, is pretty pegged. But we're like, what if we did want to actually attempt some sort of more traditional denial of service attack where we, we cared about, instead of just concurrent connections, we cared more about size of traffic, right? That's when we invoked the ass. Uh, so uh, this is actually our job titles that we use at White Hat. Um, and you can go ahead and, and get this badge. You can become a certified ass like me. You can get this badge, put it on your blog. I think there's an oath you have to recite, uh, something like that, and, and then that's it. But uh, yeah, so anyway, we, we threw this image, pretty small image, but we just threw it up there. Just to, instead of it was just four or four pages, let's throw this image up there and see if we could generate some traffic. So all of a sudden, you saw it was 43 minutes, 36 megs, 53 minutes, 117 megs. That made a big difference, right? So if we actually tried here, uh, this might be this might be pretty good. 55 minutes, 252 megs. You know, we're almost at 3,000 hits. Now we're you know, so we let it run for eight hours. 114 gigs of traffic. How many hits is that? Damn, I need comments. Four is that four million? Four, yeah, four million hits. There's still there's eight hours later. There's still 125 concurrent requests being processed. Yeah, yeah. So this you know again, and through this whole test, I don't think I spent ten dollars. Okay, like. This is really, really cheap, and I'm just pegging my Apache server for hours, right? Uh, we, we, we took down the image just because uh, our Amazon bill was getting, was getting pretty high from hacking ourselves. Uh, but you can see one day later, we have, what is that? 13 million hits in a day and six hours, 241 gigs. That's not bad, right, for a couple bucks. That's, that's not too bad. So uh, yeah, again, I think, what does this say, total that I spent? Currently have seventeen dollars left in the account. Spent fifteen. Uh, today's used funds nine dollars fifty six cents. So it's nine dollars fifty six cents and uh, a few browser minutes worth of traffic. So we do realize that this is just our uh, our default Apache install. So this wasn't terribly impressive for us that we dosed it. We weren't trying to be like, oh, look at what we did. We, did. we just wanted to kind of figure out the economics of this and and how fast we could generate this traffic. So when we did a, we did a follow up to some of this research. We did this research back in uh, July. Um, so we did a follow up pretty recently. I, uh, I called up some friends I have at Akamai. Uh, uh, and I was like, hey, I want to DOS something on your pipes. This is your kind of wheelhouse. You're into this whole DOS thing, I hear. And uh, like, I, I would like to try to you know, point my ad network at something through your pipes, not just my default Apache server. So we did. Uh, he, he wrote back, and he, he was you know, very nice, Mike, Mike Smith, for those of you who know him, you guy. Uh, he, uh, he wrote back and said, sure, I got a perfect box for you, www.akamai.com. Okay, so uh, corporate website, great. Uh, sure, let's go. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not a drop in the bucket for them, what we were gonna do. Uh, but here's the pretty graph of their traffic from, this was this Monday, so we just did this research. So you can see their, their flat line of like what they usually, that's their usual traffic that was going on at any given time. And you can see where, exactly where we turned on the, the ad network, or after 45 minutes, right, when that ad network kicked in. You can kind of see that spike, that first kind of bump goes up. Um, so when it goes down there for that little trough, who wants to guess what we did? We didn't turn it off. No, 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 we didn't kill, we didn't toss Akamai. <laughs> that would have been awesome. Ran out of money, no. The, the ad network was still running and hitting the site. We switched it to FTP. We switched it to that, that browser connection limit bypass. All of a sudden, Akamai can't see it. I don't know, I don't know what, like we just did this Monday, so we, we don't really know the implications of this. Uh, it didn't, 
didn't cause any more noise for them, I don't think. I don't, like, like since we, they couldn't see it, we don't know, right? The reason, I liked, the reason I, I liked doing this was that we actually have some visualization now of the traffic, right? Not just our logs and how many hits we have. We have how many requests per second, how many requests per minute. Um, so we were like, oh, we don't like seeing this. So, uh, you know, we're going to turn the HTTP back on. Uh, and, and, we, and we let it run for about two and a half hours total in, in time. And we averaged, I think, 300,000 requests per minute. Uh, we generated, I think it was three point something gigs per second, which wasn't much, but again, it was just 404 pages. Um, 300,000 requests per minute. I asked him, okay, this obviously didn't matter to you because you're 30% of the internet. What would matter to you? And his answer was, we would cause them some grief at around 10 million requests per minute. Akamai. We would cause Akamai grief at around 10 million requests per minute. That's not really orders of magnitude off, right? That is a few, you know, multiples. But if I ran some multiple campaigns here uh, and, and really put, I, oh, again, sorry, to, I forgot about this, this whole thing, $33. <laughs> 33, 33, but I, I went crazy. I put 30 bucks in this thing. I put 50 bucks in this thing. I still have a few bucks. If anyone wants me to doss you, I got a few bucks left in this thing. Uh, yeah, so th 300,000 requests per minute for two and a half hours cost me $33.41. Uh, not bad, right? So this stuff, uh, again, I, I'm out of time, but uh, I, I want to save, save some time for questions. Uh, but this actually does happen in the wild. Not uh, the, the ad network botnet doesn't happen in the wild, but this was actually, uh, who's heard of this OpenX software? Uh, a few of you, yeah. I, I hadn't heard of it until I saw the story. It's kind of like the cPanel for ad, it's like what ad networks use as software. Uh, there was an O-Day in that, and people hacked the actual ad network to distribute their ad network malware. So, this is obviously on people's radar, uh, but, but as far as JavaScript botnet, I, I, we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, but you know, usually we like to wrap up these presentations with some warm and fuzzy solution of how we can all protect ourselves. Uh, but like I said throughout the whole beginning part of this presentation, this is just how the web works and just loading image tags into a browser. Uh, unless people are going to turn off image tags, uh, I, don't, I, don't really, I can't really think of a way to, to stop this. This is a quote from Kaminsky that, that Jeremiah likes to use. <laughs> Nobody's breaking the web, dude. Not now, not ever. Right? That's really what we're going to have to do is try to break it in, in order to fix it. So I don't really have a warm, fuzzy ending. Sorry. I just thought this was kind of cool. So uh, I think we have five minutes for questions. Uh, two minutes. My clock's off then. I have 39. Any questions? No? Wow. I usually fly through this. All right. Cool. I'll be up here later. <laughs>